uh, this was the first uh, visualization, which was very interesting to me. And uh, so I've uh, tried to replicate it. And this is um, my first question to, uh, to, to have a discussion uh, with you is about uh, uh, parametric and non-parametric uh, methods. So when we do um, a non-parametric method, we basically um, um, try to guess what is the behavioral of this of our uh, model. And um, one way to do this is with a visualization. So uh, with the uh, data we have uh, seen um, with Jim in chapter two, um, which is income uh, um, data, uh, I have uh, replicated this uh, 3D plot using, uh, I've tried the different packages, but then it turns out that this one is the most closed one, uh, closer one to, to the one in the book, except that there is not this, uh, um, these lines here, but I'm sure that we can uh, find something better. So to, to do this, uh, which is very interesting, uh, this is done um, in 3D dimension because when we um, compute a linear regression, in this case, we use two predictors instead of just one. If we predict just, uh, if we use just one predictor, we have two dimension uh, and the dimension, uh, the number of dimension grows uh, if we had more predictors. So let's say that we are just examining, uh, we want to predict in, uh, income, this Z variable, uh, using two predictors, uh, education and seniority. Okay, so to have this uh, curved um, surface, we can't use just a linear model, but we, we need to use uh, something uh, which provides uh, not just a linear trend, because it's not just linear. Um, in, in the meaning that uh, as we have more than one predictors, the other one gets into the, the other two. And uh, so a straight line won't, won't fit the purpose. So we must use uh, this lowest uh, model. So uh, if we do the fit using lowest uh, model, and then uh, Mm, okay, the suggestion says to, to set a regular grid, and he set the regular grid as, uh, with 26 lines. Just take this as, as done it. And then what uh, it does to make this cutter 3D and obtain this visualization, it's setting um, a sequence. Uh, taking the, the, the minimum value of education the and the minimum and the maximum of education um, and set the, the length to the number of grid lines. It does the same with the, the other predictor, which is seniority. So we have X pred and uh, Y pred, which are education pred and seniority pred. And then we expand the grid with these two new elements that we have just set. If, uh, if we see, for example, this X pred, it's a list, um, it's a vector uh, with the value that we have just um, set. So the minimum and the maximum uh, within the number of grid lines. Then we expand the grid, uh, say that like we are making a matrix, 
with uh, education and seniority, and then um, if, uh, effectively make a matrix with the function matrix. We predict the fit with new data, and the new data is this uh, new grid that we have just uh, set up. Um, set in the number of row and, and the number of columns. And then finally, if we see, for example, um, if you have any questions, just jump in and ask any questions. So ZPRED, which is the matrix that contains uh, uh, the values, is just a matrix. And then the fit points, um are the predict value values of fit okay so we have the fit points are uh, this one here and then we put inside this function which is scatter 3d x y and z then uh the things that we do is like here, down here, fit equals to fit points. These, these other ones are all uh, extra uh, features, you know, that uh, it leads you to, to this visualization that I show you how it is. Oh. Okay, uh, that's the other page. Okay, so then it will be like this. Okay, not exactly, exactly the same as it should is in the book. What what package does Scatter Three D come from? Sorry, I think I missed this. This is Plot Three D. Plot Three D. And you do Scatter Three D. Then the three uh, Z is the um, uh, the outcome and the x and y are the predictors then you have some uh, options uh, like features to to set the colors and everything uh, this is are uh, the x lab so the the, the names of the um, uh, x and y lab x y and z lab and then you set the surface Oops, there you go. And then you said the surface and fit the, uh, as equals to fit points. This is all one uh, function. This is main. Okay, so you have uh, uh, this thing. The, the surface, which will be equals to a list. So this is the, the things that leads you to this plot. As you can see, uh, the surface, you, you can obtain um, the other one, the, the, like the, the straight panel with a linear model just lm instead of lois but if you want to more curved uh, surface you, you need to do to use uh, a different model which is not a linear one so you can use lois so i thought that was interesting um, and this is the thing i don't know if you have any questions Okay, so 
then the other thing I wanted to, to ask you, <laughs> basically, is um, when we see in the book, uh, uh, I might want to make confusion, but uh, when we go through the mean square error and we assessing the model accuracy, uh, there is this nice plot, this one here, okay, which I really like it, and I wanted to replicate, but I, I, I haven't found much information uh, unless we will be able to do further on within the, the future chapters in the book. So about this, this uh, figure 2.9, the book says, uh, the figure uh, illustrates this phenomenon on a simple uh, example. Um, so we have generated observation from 2.1 with the true F given by the black curve. So the 2.1 thing, where is it? Uh, 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 uh. So, two point four. Okay. So this is the simple, uh, you know, the outcome, the function for the, com the, 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 the combination of the predictors. Uh, my connection is unstable, if anything, and then the residuals. So I suppose, and then, um, so I suppose that uh, he, they use it, the, the income data set, then they have simulated some data like using bootstrapping. And uh, um, they did some uh, like applied with uh, different level of splines to see which one was the best fit for uh, doing a non-parametric uh, analysis. Because when you do non-parametric, you make assumptions. So for doing this thing, um, I've tried different things. So maybe, um, like when you do a bootstrap uh, and you want to, you are simulating thing, you are generating more values around the real F and then decide that the, the, the mean of this real, real values are um, the, the closest one to, what you are searching for as a predicting uh, the outcome. So um, there are uh, two methods for applying uh, the bootstrap. And uh, I don't know if you want to go through this, but um, uh, to obtain this, uh, I've tried to replicate this graph. Okay, I haven't been able to do that. But what I did it is to uh, I, um, take the um, uh, income uh, data set and then uh, um, use, it, use it this function, specify. And this is an um, interesting function which comes from uh, uh, infer package. Okay, this specify, I don't know if you know the, the function. 
um, this function in, with this function, you specify some elements, some vector in the data set in a way that you can the, uh, just use this, um, the sales, for example, and then specify, so a response variable and an explanatory variable, then you hypothesize the, uh, the, the null hypothesis, uh, the, the independence of the null hypothesis, then you set the, the, the mean value of the real population, and then generate, the, you just do bootstrapping, generate a thousand replication. Um, so in a way that you obtain a new data set, and this new data set will be used to, uh, together with the original data, and so I merge it, these two, and then I plot it. So because he said he used the real F, so the, the black line here is the real F. So I needed to plot the real F with some extra uh, replication. I don't know if it's totally correct, but the way I did it is the, um, where is it? This DF1 is TV, radio, newspaper, and sales. Oh no, this is not the income. So, uh, mm, no, this is the advertising uh, data set. I don't know if, because that was the, uh, that was a mention uh, that uh, the 2.1 was the advertising uh, data set. Okay, so let's say that this is the advertising data set. So, and this DF1 uh, is the advertising data set, okay? Which I have just uh, taken the, the first column uh, out because originally uh, that was this, no? So you have this uh, new data set which is advertising, and then um, I specified the cells and the, so the response and the explanatory variable, uh, hypothesize independence, set the mean as is the mean um, of the original mean, and then generate some, a thousand of bootstrap. Then I did the plot, okay? So the plot, uh, using ggplot, I used the, the data uh, simulated, which are this one here, and they are uh, this. So the bootstrap and the merge it with the, uh, the original data set. Uh, then taken these two TV and sales, and then I've generated some points. And then uh, this one, two, three, four, five, six smooth lines. One is the black one without any, nothing. So it, it, it should be the, the real one. And then the other ones are with um, the not linear, so the gam method, and then a polynomial for six, nine, and 12 uh, elements, and then a spline. So that would, that can be done with splines with different, um, at different levels or with poly different level of polynomials. Then you need to set the, the, the X and Y limb and to obtain this thing.
takes a while. Why is it? Why it takes too long? I don't know. But anyway, uh, the out, ah, there you go. So this is the, the outcome. So the, the black line is the, just the geom smooth of the merged thing with the bootstrap and the, are there any questions? And these other lines are the other geoms smooth with different polynomials, six, nine, and 12. So the straight line in orange, where is it? Is the linear model. And my question is this, how did they do, where is it? Sorry about that. How did they do this? Oh no, this is the other one. This one here. So the, the graph of the mean square error and the flexibility. Okay, because the flexibility. Is flexibility yeah. just the number of parameters here? So for example, in a straight line, you have two parameters, the blue line, I guess it's probably what a quintic or a septiclic. <laughs> um, and then, I don't know what the polynomial is. I guess it's probably 21 points. And then they basically just have what a training and a test error. So oh. yeah, so I guess the way you could do it, uh, I think you wouldn't wanna. Yeah, Ferica, I think that you want to split to get that right graph, right, uh, you know, the, 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 the plot to the right. I think what they're trying to tell you is that you have to split that data set into the training and the test, okay? So okay. The, the curve, the curve, the lower curve, what it's telling you is how the training is trying to optimize the mean square error, okay? And it's going all the way down, right? You know, with more flexibility, right? But mm -hmm. then in the test, you have, you know, a point where it doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't lower that metric. So for example, those points, uh, you know, those points in the middle, the, those blue points there, tor the turquoise, uh, that will be the optimal. The optimal uh, uh -huh. uh, metric, uh, you know, the mean square error, the optimal mean square error for that model. Because what you're doing after that is basically overfitting the, okay. the, the model, okay? Because the training keeps going down, okay? But the training is just going a little bit up and then goes, you know, somewhere. So anytime uh -huh. that you put more, what they say, more flexibility, more, uh, you know, uh, more complex method, then you start to get overfitting. Uh -huh. So I think that's the message that, uh -huh. the, you know, that, that somewhere between uh -huh. five and six, it's the optimum mean square error for this, for this model. Okay. Right. I think in terms so, of making the plot, yeah. you could just take the, the training error from, I mean, one of these, you can take the bootstraps right. um, that in 370, I'm not sure if it's the same data, but 347 and 348. So mm -hmm. if you split it into a training and test, and then yeah, fit each of those polynomials it. and then mm -hmm. basically plot the um, number of parameters by mm -hmm. the error from each of those would be basically what you do. And you'll get, it won't look exactly exactly. like that probably, but it'll look okay. similar. Like something similar, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so because what I did it here is to split the thing with mm -hmm. study models, I've used it initial split. So split the thing. Right. And then uh, um, I've calculated the mean square error. Uh, but basically this, um, mm, I don't know if they are just three values that they have been uh, um, connected with group one with G, G plot. I don't yeah. know, because you, you, you 
you use group equals one when you just have three points, no? And you want to connect the, these three points with geom line, you use group equal one. Mm -hmm. And the, the ggplot and the, the, the geom line will connect the, the points. Okay. Uh, but but I don't I know if they to, are, yeah. So to get to get those squares in the graph, I think you have to choose the you know the degree, okay, of each of yeah. them. For example, th those yeah. at, the, at the left, those uh, you know kind of orange, pale orange ones, they correspond to two, okay. Then the what the other ones mm -hmm. correspond to five or six, maybe six, and then the other ones are twenty something, okay. Mm -hmm. So somewhere you have to you know make sure that you have to choose those points and then align them. You know, to these two plots. Okay, so uh, <laughs> yeah, the, this this is this is this, this is, is all work. for me. <laughs> right, right, yeah. right. So this is all for me. So the floor <laughs> is yours, Ricardo. For <laughs> we jump, uh, stop sharing, and we jump to chapter three. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, okay. One of the things Thank that you. is is you know just to add to the to the bootstrap thing is that uh, yeah. usually Bootstrap, you use it where you have a small, you know, a, a small sample, okay? And you want to generate more samples out of that original sample. But uh -huh. for example, if you have a data set that has 10,000 observations and they're good data, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of academic, you know, the, the, the Bootstrap. You, you really don't, 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 don't need it. It's just for those yeah. small, you know, like surveys, for example, that you survey, let's say, a thousand people and you want to get more samples out of it, then, you know, Bootstrap is the, mm -hmm. is the method uh, to go. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's get to the linear regression. Yes. Okay. Let me share my screen. Where is the screen here? Okay. Let me see. Okay. Can you, can you see my screen? Yeah, but it's the yeah. Zoom thing. Right. <laughs> yeah. All righty. <laughs> so let's continue. And the next chapter, chapter three of the introduction to statistical learning is called linear regression. Okay. And this is something that you're going to be seeing in this book and any other book that, that, that deals with statistics or even, uh, you know, machine learning. Uh, you, you really have to go through, through this. Okay. To linear regression because it's the first model. Historically, it's the first model. That, that we have, uh, you know, that basically what it does, and we have seen it in chapter two, what it does is that it tries to explain uh, a variable that you have, for example, in this case, it was in advertising, it was uh, uh, TV, you know, TV uh, sales or newspaper uh, sales per unit, et cetera. And you want to find a way to relate them to a dependent variable, in this case, sales. So linear regression or regression in general is what, you know, gives you that framework. Uh, one of the things I want to point out is that regression uh, is more of a concept, okay? So regression, usually you use it when you want to model the dependent variable, uh, you want to model one that is continuous, okay? So for example, if you want to model sales, if you want to model temperature, like the weather, for example. Uh, if you want to model anything that is continuous, weight, height, etc., then the method that you use usually is a regression. This one in particular, and we're going to, you know, I did some, uh, uh, some slides, you know, to uh, get into, into the lab because this was already, uh, you know, uh, beat, beat, beat down there in cohort number one. So I think with the labs, we'll get a little more, you know, more, more in, uh, in intuition. But uh, for example, regression, what it would call linear regression is uh, a, a model that minimizes, minimizes what is called the, the sum of the square uh, errors, okay? And you will see, you know, in the model, you will see what an error is. So let's go quickly to the objectives, okay? Uh, we talk about, you know, performing regression with a single predictive variable that's called simple linear regression, okay? That's the simplest model. You have one independent variable and one dependent, 
and you want to see what is the relationship between them. Then we're going to see some estimates of the standard of error of those coefficients, okay? Because one of the things that is going to explain the relationship between the dependent and the dependent is the intercept and the coefficient of that uh, independent, what is called the slope of, of that line. Uh, we're going to get into the good test of fitness tests. Then we're going to then apply the model instead of only one independent variable, we're going to then add more variables to make it a multiple linear regression. And that's basically the model that you see, you know, that you, because you usually have more than one variable to explain the variance of that dependent variable. And then also the relative importance, which is tied with the coefficients, uh, some interaction effects or say, okay, so if you have two variables, right? Let's say that you have like in the, in the advertising, you have TV and you have radio. So sometimes you want to see, okay, if I combine those two, what is the, what is the effect on the model? What is the interaction between them? And if it, you know, contributes to the model, okay, to the explanation of the model or, or if, it, you know, if it doesn't. Uh, then we are going to perform linear regression with qualita quali qualitative uh, predictive variables. Those are the ones that are not numbers, okay? They are basically labels. Uh, for example, a uh, survey. Uh, you do a survey and uh, usually what do you ask? Okay, well, how do you feel today? Okay, so how do you feel today? You, cannot, you can answer with a number, but that number reflects your state, okay, of how do you feel today? You feel good, you feel bad, or you feel, you know, so-and-so. So that's an example of a qualitative operative variable. And we'll see how R in particular, R is very funny in that, in that, in that sense. Uh, how does it interpret uh, those qualitative if we have time today? Uh, then we're going to go to the nonlinear relationships and then uh, trying to identify some nonlinear components, uh, usually with the recipients of, of that model. And then uh, I'm still scratching my head because they, they introduce something that is kind of, you know, a little bit out of the park here, which is the comparison of the linear regression with the KNM regression, okay? Which is basically a model that cluster, you know, uses cluster to do that. I guess, you know, there's some academic, you know, reason for that, but, you know, you know I show it because it's there in, in the book. Is it not just because it's, it's the first thing we learned? Because we learned KNN in chapter two. And I wonder if that, that's why they right. compared it. Maybe they're picking up, you know, from there. You know, I, I would, you know, I, I would like to contrast more with the logistic regression, which is a classification model. So, you know, you get a real contrast in there, but hey, you know, <laughs> I'm not the author, so <laughs> I'm just following the script here. <laughs> okay, so uh, there's some, you know, in, in tying to the chapter two of the advertising that we have been, you know, talking about, and Jim did, did an excellent job there. Uh, there's some questions about that, um, that data set that regression or regression in particular, you know, can be, you know, useful to that. For example, relationship between advertising budget and sales, uh, media associated with sales and all that. So those are questions that usually you start, you know, when you start studying that data set, when you do your exploratory data analysis, uh, those are the questions that you could, you, know, you, sh you should be asking, okay? Because before doing the model, you should get to know the data, okay? And that's one of the things that data science, you know, uh, tries to answer. Not only the model, but how do you arrive, you know, to that, to that point? So let's go quickly to, uh, you know, the simple linear regression. And then, you know, I'm going, after this, I'm going to switch then to the lab exercises, because I think we're going to get a little more, you know, more uh, out of it. But to start, you know, with the premises, start, you know, with the right foot, uh, this, the simple linear regression is basically, is a relationship between an X variable, the independent variable, and a Y variable, the dependent uh, one. So when X changes, okay, there's some variance in X, then how does it traduces, translates to the Y, okay? And that's what this model is trying to explain. And there are just two parameters here. You have uh, beta, beta naught, okay, which is the, the intercept. That's when x is equal to zero, right? When x is equal to zero, this component here, I don't know if you can 
uh, see the mouse, right? This component here disappears. Okay, so you have y equal to uh, beta naught. Okay, that's the intercept. Then you have the beta uh, one, right? The, the slope, which is the gradient, okay, of that line. So you can imagine, remember your class in geometry and algebra, you can define a line with two points, right? You know, you, you point two points and then you can, you know, do a straight line. But there's another method to that. You can start your line with a single point, but then you tell the line how high or how low you want to get those, those numbers that are included in the line. That is called the slope, okay? So each change in X is going to traduce in a change in Y, okay? And basically that's the most simple interpretation that you can you know, have in the simple linear regression model. And what we're doing is that we're drawing an estimate because this uh, equation is the, what is called the true equation, right? The, the true you know, fit of those points. So what we're doing here is modeling with an estimate of those parameters. So beta naught hat, right, is an estimate of the beta naught. And beta naught one is the estimate of the, be the true beta one, okay? So let's go then to the, to the lab exercises, okay, to get things more interesting. Uh, I did already the, you know, the markdown, you know, I put it in the slides. If you want to follow me, okay, I did, you know, in my, in my GitHub, uh, there's a repository where, you know, this, uh, this whole, you know, data is in. So let me go, where is the chat here? Uh, where is the chat here? Uh, there you go. At the bottom where the participants are, the share of the screen, at the bottom of the, the screen, uh, okay. below everything, there is the participant, chat, and share screen. Where did you share the screen? Uh, How did you share the screen? Uh, I, I, just, I just picked the screen and I okay. shared. Okay. So you, you go at the, at the bottom of your screen. Okay. And you see that there is participant, chat. Uh, no, in, um, uh, no, you need to, uh, the, the chat is. Um, oh, it sometimes hides on a little bar when you go full screen and you're yeah. sharing screen. So you're basically right. looking for a black bar. If you hover at the top or at the bottom of your screen, sometimes it'll appear. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> we got it. Okay, so this is the link to the GitHub. Okay, so if you want to, you know, join me, uh, you know, you can you can fork it and then you know, uh, uh, do you know do 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 your do your link up. Um, so I did this, okay, just to organize, you know, the lab exercises. This is in the book, right? It starts in 3.6, okay? The labs, the linear regression. So just to recap, right? So the linear regression model, I don't know if you have noticed, right? But remember in chapter two that we talk about supervised learning and unsupervised learning, right? So the linear regression model or the regression models are supervised. In other words, you have in a data set, you have something that is going to show you what you are predicting against, okay? So this is going to have a label uh, so somewhere. So that's basically the supervised uh, learning. Then the linear regression, uh, you are going to see this in other books, and you're going to see that it's named also OLS, okay? Ordinary least squares, why? Because that's what the model is, is, is doing. It's fitting the best line possible, minimizing uh, the errors, the errors from the line to the two points, okay? And that's what is called the, the least squares. And I got this, you know, it was funny. I, I, was, I was checking on information. I got this uh, meme that it says, when you advertise, okay, it's artificial intelligence, okay? When you hire, it's machine learning. But when you implement, it's linear regression, 
Okay, and there's a you know there, there's a little uh, you know story there because try to for example you know we know that there's you know a lot of you know complex models around there you know deep learning uh, boosting all that you know fancy stuff but then try to explain you know a deep learning model that's just playing to a man <laughs> to a boss okay try to explain it you know if, when, when he says okay if i raise my my you know my independent variable let's say uh tv tv advertising let's let's clear the, the advertising if we spend more how does this translate to sales how does this translate to this okay of we reduce cost the beauty about regression especially general regression is that the 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 model is 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 very apparent okay it's, it's like a white box okay everything is there uh to you to interpret and also to try to figure out you know what is the interaction between independent and dependent variables so uh you know the lesson is you know that don't discard the linear regression because sometimes it's an easier model that is going to give you you know the average you know for your you know analysis and also for your communication with some people that they don't know, you know, too much about it, okay? And that's not their job, really. That's your job, okay? So let's get into it. So um, I took the liberty. Uh, the lab exercises in the in the in the book uh, they use what is called the Boston uh, data set. You know, it's a widely uh, known uh, data set about. Uh, uh, demographics and also, uh, you know, uh, housing, uh, housing prices. Uh, the problem with Boston, you know, it has, it has, has, you know, a lot of controversies is that it uses features that they are kind of, you know, that, 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 that they're, that they're not, um, that they don't contribute to fairness. Uh, let's put it that way. Okay. And there's some features you can, you know, read, read about them. I, I don't think, you know, because we're recording, I don't think, you know, we should delve on, on that. But uh, for example, in, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the tidy models uh, version of the lab, for example, uh, Emil says that the Boston data set is quite outdated and it's true, it's, it's, it's like in the seventies or something. And also contains some really unfortunate uh, variables. Okay, so I took the liberty to try to update, okay, our, our exercises to use an alternate housing data set. And you will see, you know, what, what, it, what, what it's about. It's something about housing prices, but it's not in the US. It's, uh, it comes from, from Australia, okay? So one of the things that you want to do, if you want to use, you know, you, you, know, you can use it, of course, but I think you're going to get more insight uh, with other data sets and you'll get the same, with some, the same benefit. So that data set is in, it's in the library. I think it's in the library ISLR R2 or in mass. Okay, I, I commented there. And then we're going to use, you know, a little bit of the dplyr uh, methods to try to, you know, read the data set and, and do, do some do some minimal, minimal rank. Okay, so we're going to use what is called the Melbourne uh, Housing Market uh, Kaggle data set. And this data set comes from Australia. And it's a data set that they did a web scraping exercise and they took a lot of information from the, from the city of Melbourne, particularly in the years 2017 and 2018. If you go to the Kaggle side, one of the reasons that they wanted to study this data is that apparently there was a bubble, you know, housing bubble, like we had, you know, in the US in general, we had in 2007, 2008, that it created a, you know, like a recession. After that, you know, the, the, the mortgage, the sub, subprime mortgage crisis. So in Australia, uh, they, they, they were expressing something like that 10 years, you know, after, after our, our crisis. So some of the features here are price, and that's the target, okay? Price is a dependent variable, which is the price in Australian dollars. Then you have the type of housing, okay? And here, the type of housing is a qualitative uh, a predictor. Okay, qualitative variable. It's not in numbers, it's more in labels. So you have houses, for example, H is for house, cottage, villa, semi, terrace, etc. U is for the unit or a duplex, okay? You know, two houses, you know, uh, sharing a, a common, you know, a common boundary. And then you have a town. Then you have the method. How is the method of, of the sale? 
you have the council area, which in our case, it will be like a, like an MS, you know, from the census, an MS type. Then you have a distance. Distance, we're going to use it because distance is really interesting. It's the distance of that property from the center of business, okay? So for example, if you're in New York, usually the center of business you think is Wall Street, right? So for example, uh, imagine Wall Street in Melbourne and then drawing a line, okay, to the distance of the, your property to that, to that center. And we're going to be studying it that and it's in kilometers. Then you have the number of car, car spaces, uh, the year, which is, it was extracted from the date. And then, you know, we have the year, the month and the, and the date. And then we have, it was funny that, you know, they included a, another T there. I don't know why, but they include also the latitude and the longitude. So we have also special data that we can then, you know, uh, do, do some stuff there. Okay, so that's the explanation of the data set that we're going to be using. Then, uh, the first thing, read the data set, right? So we're going to do, use the reader only once here. And then we're going to use already a clean data set. I have, you know, the script, you know, for how, how I took the raw data and then converted to a clean data set. I don't think this is part of the, you know, of the chapter, but, you know, you have to do some wrangling because it is, it's from the web directly and there's some missing values, some inconsistencies, et cetera. So we're going to do the reading, right? And then I don't know if you know that there's a package called Janitor, Okay, it's been widely used in Tidy Tuesdays, for example. And what I'm doing with the janitor, and it just, I'm going to do it once because, you know, that's the, that's the function that, that I want. I'm going to clean some of the names. For example, some of the names have, you know, uh, capital letters, right? Uh, you know, capital letters. And also they have, uh, you know, they have uh, spaces or something. So the janitor clean names cleans automatically your, uh, the names of the, of those features, okay? So here we have the features that we're going to be you know, looking for. We have price, we have type, method, council area, and so forth. And we're going to be working with price and distance, okay? So the next slide, I think you, you know, you're, you're expecting that we're going to do a regression with those two, with those two uh, components, okay? Uh, question so far? Good. Okay. So let's fit. Let's fit a model. Let's fit a linear regression model. Uh, I'm still using the the book. Okay. You can go and and you know do your own stuff in tidy models. You know with Emil. You know uh, aside, but I'm using still the base R because it's first it's very simple, and also it gives you you know more functionality. You know, because remember that R, because it's, you know, the background is statistics. Uh, there's a lot of commands that are very easy to implement here. So I'm still sticking with the base part. So one of the things that you're going to notice in the lab is that if you try to fit this uh, model with price and distance without uh, giving the data set, it's going to, you know, it's going to show an error. So what you can do is there are two, two methods to this. You can then add the data, the parameter, right? Data, which is housing in this case, okay? You can do that or you can attach, use the function attach for the data set and then you can use the, the syntax without the data, okay? So let me show it to you, you know, in real, in real time, <laughs> okay? In real time. So if you have this, for example, the LMF fit, right? Okay, let me put this. Okay, wait a minute. Uh, 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 uh. Sorry, uh, Ricardo, can you, can you just uh, put the, the font a little bit bigger? Bigger, okay. Let me see. Global options, uh, bah, bah, bah. appearance, okay, fun, okay. How is that? Better? Better. Yeah. Okay. So we did the first one, right? 
the first um, a line, okay, which is creating a linear, a linear model, LM, linear model with price as the dependent, distance as independent, and then the data. And here, if you if you do this, LM fit, okay, they're going to see that it returns the model and then it returns some information. Okay, and we'll, we'll go there. Then if we do the attach, okay, and then just simply uh, do the model without uh, giving the, the data back, okay, you will have the same result. The thing is that now because it's attached to the environment of the R, you know, environment that you're using, uh, you don't have to specify the data anymore for the base R uh, functions, okay? So let's go back here. So we have our fit. Then uh, R uh, makes it very easy to get a summary of that model. So you have in the element fit, you have, you know, an object, what is called an object in R that has, you know, a lot of information there, okay? A lot of information, you know, pa packed there. So summary, what it does is that it gives you a summary of the information that is within the MML fit. So let's see what kind of information do we have here. Um, before that, uh, I, I know that you noticed that you got, you know, from the ML, LML fit right, right off the bat without the summary, you got the intercept, remember, when x is zero, okay, when there's no distance, right now, there's no distance, that will be the price of a house, okay, or the average price of the, of the unit. Then you have the slope. And as you can see, this slope is negative. So uh, if, if you remember your geometry and algebra, what happens when the slope is negative? It decreases, right? So there's an inverse uh, proportion between the increase in distance and the, and, and the variation in, pri in price. So as we increase distance, the price is going to get lower, okay? Okay, so you have you know, a line that instead of going you know, uh, from, left, from left to right increasing, are going to have something that is going to be decreasing. Okay, so, you have here, the first thing that you can notice in the, in the summary is the residuals, okay? The residuals are the errors. So when you have that line and you, you know, the, the points, and I will show you, you know, the, the, the graph, you know, in the next slide. When you have that line, each of those points has a distance between that line and the point, okay? And that's the error. So the residuals are that, you know, that, that, that uh, parameter, that magnitude of it. So you see that there's errors in the, mi in the minimum uh, range, errors as bad as uh, a million, <laughs> a negative million, or 115, 369, and as maximum, as positive as uh, 1, 1 million, 91,093, okay? That gives you the range of those errors. Obviously, in a good model, you want to minimize, you know, those errors, you know, and there's ways to do it. Then you have the coefficients, and already you had the coefficients here, right? But then you have some things called standard error, the t-value, and the p-value, okay? So the standard error is going to be what we are going to use for the confidence, for the confidence interval. So if you add this number to this estimate, it's going to give you the upper uh, confidence interval. If you subtract it, then it gives you the minimum, okay? So it gives you like a band, a band in that line of the intercept and also of the slope, okay? Then what about the p-value? The p-value, what it's saying is that how significant is that parameter? Let's take distance, for example, okay? Distance is negative 22,000, right? And the start of error is 635. So if you add it or subtract it, you're going to get numbers that they don't cross zero, okay? 
In other words, the significance that you are testing, the hypothesis that you are testing, is that if that coefficient can be zero, okay? So the p-value is going to tell you the probability of that coefficient in that model being zero. And as you can see, this is a very, very small number, okay? It's less than two to the power of minus 16. It's a very small number. So that means that the probability of that coefficient not being significant is basically neg negligible. So if you do the hypothesis testing, you can, you know, you can, uh, you know, you can conclude that that estimate do, will not be zero in this model. Yeah, okay? it but be, it one, significant. one point uh -huh. I always have about yes. like p values is that yes. I mean this data set has how many data points? It has around twenty thousand. So the problem. I'm very against using p-values for anything, mm -hmm. almost, personally. Because yes. um, whenever mm -hmm. you have a ton of data points, you always get a significant p-value. Like, depending on what right. you're testing, you almost always get a significant p-value with enough data points. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that's my one quirk. Yep. Whenever, you, whenever it shows super tiny and people are like, oh, look at the tiny p-value. Um, right. Because the R-squared on this, I, I followed on your HTML, is real crap, right? It's like 0. 0.005. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, um, but we can, we yeah, can learn from, but we can learn from this, okay? Yeah, so you know, so um, sometimes also, you get this, these numbers yeah, yeah. and you can learn from this in terms of, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. you know, how can I improve, right? Okay, go ahead. Ann. Um, yeah. And I, I also yeah. have to run. Uh, I have a hard stop today at like five o'clock. Okay. So okay. Um, okay. what do you do instead of p-values? I typically focus on the effect size, whatever the effect size that it is. Mm -hmm. In this case, it would be R squared. Um, but right. it depends on what you really care about. I typically just say a p-value is significant or not, and then stop thinking about the p-value. That's, that's how I deal with them right. um, to answer Michael's question. Uh, thank you guys so much. Hopefully we'll continue next week. I'll try and catch up on the recording, what I've missed. Okay. Bye. Yeah, probably <laughs> go to good Bye. yeah, I should stop at 11 as well. If we could just mm -hmm. um, yeah, pick up next week, that'd be great. Okay, sure. Sure. Of course, yeah. Uh, as I said, we don't mind if, uh, the the yeah. the chapter yeah. takes more. I mean, more it's, it's, it's already, it's already yeah. twelve, so we should start. Yeah. <laughs> Good. All right. If, 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 would you like to wrap things up and then we continue next time? Uh, yes. Ah, uh, so uh, okay. remember, a linear regression. You know what the model that what it's trying to do is you know, minimize those least squares, you know, in a, in, a, in a line, you know, get the best fit of a line. Uh, good, you know, comment on Anna in terms of the relevance of the p-values. Uh, usually, you know, when you have a, a lot of data, those values can get skewed. And, you know, just pointing out that the R-square, uh, usually you have to be very careful because the R-square per se, the one that is, you know, without any modifications, if you add features you know, to your model, if you have infinite variables, usually it goes higher, okay? No matter you know, what the contribution is. So that's a good point in terms of you know, the value of these metrics and how you should you know, interpret. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you next right. time. So we'll Bye. <laughs>